everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about why you likely don't need to buy the BAC8000 by ASI for the Ceron and we will also be giving a crash course on electronics and theoretical calculations at the end. So stick with us because this video will be fairly technical but it will also be very informative. A common misconception is that the BAC8000 offers performance benefits over the BAC4000 when the parameters are the same at the same power levels that are reasonable for the motor. This is not the full story. The BAC4000 can reliably handle 12 to 15 kilowatts continuously. That is a lot of power. If you go higher than that, then yes, the 8000 can handle more amperage and has a larger heat sink to dissipate heat. That being said, if heat is your main concern with the BAC4000, then I can assure you that your motor will probably melt before your BAC4000 controller does. Regardless, we have motor and controller temp sensors to protect your hardware that will automatically thermal throttle if things start to get too warm. The only reason you would want to go to the BAC8000 is if you plan on running more power than that or have some desire for more phase amps at lower power levels. It's important to note that the 4000 can do 450 phase amps while the 8000 can do a bit more at around 600. But that generates more heat, uses more power so you get less range, and 450 is already a crazy amount for the Suron. A lot of people see Jack Cecil's video where he dynos a BAC8000 and compares it to the BAC4000. In the video, he's running 17 kilowatts of power on a 72 volt battery with 570 phase amps and shows the BAC8000 gain four horsepower at the beginning and at the end of the dyno curve. He gets this gain by increasing the phase amps past what the BAC4000 can handle. Running over 17 kilowatts with 570 phase amps may be all fun and games when your bike is strapped down to a dyno, but if you're running that kind of power on the trails, you probably won't even be able to stand up because it will be so twitchy and prone to lifting the front wheel. I've seen tons of people post videos of them trying to out 15 kilowatts for the first time on the Suron and getting whiskey throttle almost immediately as it's just too twitchy to be easily controlled. With such a short wheelbase, if you give it too much throttle at all, the bike just loops out faster than you can process what's happening. Unless you're going for top speed runs, I would try and stay away from those power levels. We talk often with Suronster. He's another Suron YouTuber with crazy talent. As many of you already know, he got a light speed battery in our ASI BAC4000 controller kit. Although the light speed battery that he has is capable of more than the controller is, we set him up to have 13 kilowatts of power. And even then, he does wheelies on power level five out of nine. Controllability for Saronster is more important as having a smooth throttle control and reasonable power levels are imperative when you are doing dangerous stunts on one wheel. Although Saronster is doing things most of us only dream of, controllability and ease of use should be a priority for everyone. The key word here is usable power. One of the things we get complimented on most is how smooth the power delivery on our tune is and we really believe that it's very important. The boundaries of what the chassis can put down run out before the boundaries of what the BAC4000 can provide. The main limiting factor here is traction, wheelbase, and controllability. The rear tire is only so wide, and at a certain point, you're just gonna be running out of traction constantly. The Suron chassis is also very light and has such a short wheelbase that the front tire comes up very quick with too much power. When there's too steep of a curve, like the one uh, Jack Cecil has when he dynoed the BAC8000, only becomes cumbersome to use. When controllability starts to suffer, twitchiness on a tight single track is nothing but dangerous. Now, we want to give a little crash course on electronics and basic calculations because the comments suggest in our YouTube videos that there's a severe lack of knowledge and we'd like to help with that. All right, let's get started on the basics. We need to start with Ohm's law, which is the relationship of V is equal to I times R. And this V is equal to volts. And we can just drop that down there to solve for it, where V is equal to I times R. And the unit for volts is V, pretty easy to remember. And then here the variable I is current. And I is equal to V over R. And this is in amps, that's the units. 
and then we have R is resistance, where R is equal to V over I, and the units for resistance is ohms. So those are the basics there. Let's talk about power and how we calculate that. So power for electric motors is measured in watts, and the variable for that is W, that is also the unit. Very easy to remember, and we know that watts is equal to volts times current I. So if you wanna uh, figure out what the power of the, the stock Suron is, we know that the Suron is 60 volts. That's a nominal voltage. Obviously, you know, there's a max voltage charge and then it drops um, as you discharge the battery. But the nominal voltage is 60 volts, so that's what we're going to use. And the BMS can do 80 amps continuously. Now, if we want to know the watts of the stock battery with those numbers, we can calculate that very easily with 60 volts times 80 amps gives us 4,800 watts. And that is the number that we um, put into our egg rider display for the BAC 4000. And that is the most you can do without risking shutting off your BMS. Now, if you want to convert watts to horsepower, that is something that we can do. So power in horsepower is equal to power in kilowatts divided by a simple number of 0, .0 or 0 0.74569 and that goes on but you really don't need to use all the numbers that we have. Now let's talk about battery capacity. This is a measurement that comes from uh, the battery manufacturer and it is given uh, capacity in units of amp hours. They calculate this by just seeing how many hours a battery lasts in time and multiplying that times a steady current draw in amps. Now, uh, the, the more important number that you want to look at when talking about an electric motorcycle if you want to think about you know how long a battery is going to last you need to talk about watt hours and we can go from amp hours to watt hours very easily by multiplying your amp hours times volts so if we know that we have a 60 volt battery and the Suron's battery is 32 amp hours we can multiply that and figure out that 60 times 32 comes out to 1920 amp hours on the stock battery. Oh, excuse me, not amp hours, watt hours. Now you can do this for 72 volt batteries, 60 volt batteries. Um, the possibilities are truly endless and if you know a current draw, let's say you have a 32 amp hour battery and you're getting an average power draw of, I don't know, let's say 2000 watts at 60 volts, you know, so divide that by 60 volts to give us our current draw in amps. So 2000 divided by 60 gives us about 33.33 amps continuous. We can divide that over here. 33 amps those units cancel out and we get 32 divided by 33.33 so that will last for 96 percent of an hour so you'll get you know just under 60 minutes there that is the theoretical max given no losses so obviously you won't get that but uh, these are just some basic calculations and you can kind of see um, you know, what it takes to kind of start getting an estimate of what's going on with, with your battery system. And, you know, we could go on about this for ages, but I want to move on to some other topics, uh, that are equally as important. 
we get a lot of questions asking us if certain components will increase the range of their bike. I'm going to reference the first law of thermodynamics to try to explain how we answer these questions. The first law states that energy is conserved, or in other words, energy cannot be created or destroyed. There are really only a couple things that we consider. Efficiency of the system, capacity of the battery, and power draw from the battery. These range questions are hard to answer because while the BAC 4000 may have better heat efficiencies than the stock controller, it also allows you to increase your power draw, which can make you cover more ground faster, but as you do that, you increase air resistance and friction everywhere in the drivetrain. So while heat efficiency is better and the performance is better, you might still drain your battery faster. The only way to really increase range is to increase the capacity of your battery or to decrease your power draw. Efficiencies are typically better at low speeds as well, so the losses of drivetrain friction, air friction, and heat all increase with higher power levels. The next thing we're going to cover is the characteristics of amperage and voltage to reach the same power. Increasing voltage will allow you to get a higher top speed, while increasing current will allow you to get more torque. Another thing to consider is heat production from your current. Increasing the current will likely increase your heat production in the motor slightly more than increasing the voltage would to get to the same power levels. If you are riding your bike on the road, a higher voltage battery may be better suited for you. If you're riding off-road on tight single track, a higher amperage 60 volt may fit your needs better. Now we're going to cover phase amps. This is pretty complex, so I will try to get through it as quickly as possible, but there is a lot to cover here. The phase current to the battery current ratio is not a fixed value. It is constantly changing based on throttle inputs and load, but a max limit can be set by the controller. Essentially, phase current increases when the battery DC current is converted down to drive the motor. The phase current controls the torque and resistive heat generation which dominates motor efficiency at low to moderate RPM. The phase current can be much greater than the battery current at low speed. Phase current makes more torque up to the point of magnetic saturation in your motor. If you push your phase current past the magnetic saturation point of the motor, you will see diminishing returns of power with exponential increases in heat. Phase current squared makes heat in the motor, so you quickly overheat with a high phase current for only a modest improvement in torque because the heat grows exponentially. Riley and I ride off-road and do a lot of lower speed acceleration and deceleration intermittently. So we set the phase amps to the point where the bottom end torque is useful and controllable. There's no point in throwing the front wheel upward too quickly, that's just wasted torque. This needs to be considered for everybody's personal riding style. If you're using this to commute and you're going top speed for extended periods of time, then you may want to consider turning your phase amps down to mitigate heat production and ensure the longevity of your motor. The battery current is what determines your maximum power and this has a greater effect on higher speed power levels. If that doesn't accelerate quickly enough, you need to start changing equipment. Setting the phase amp limit doesn't directly control the phase amps, it just causes the controller to limit the PMW, or PWM, excuse me. When the phase current approaches the limit, the only PWM is controlled, and PWM is short for pulse width modulation, and that is how the power of most motors are controlled. Essentially, the controller does not deliver continuous power at a varying level to the motor. It adjusts the duty cycle by pulsing power to the motor. If either the phase current or the motor current exceed their limits, the PWM is what's actually limited, which causes both battery current and phase current to stop increasing. Now we need to cover field weakening, which is another important parameter that you need to understand. Field weakening enables higher motor speeds by reducing the electromotive force generated by the motor. Electro electromotive force is often abbreviated to EMF. EMF is a voltage created when a coil turns inside a magnetic field. It opposes the supply of the driving voltage in order to weaken the field that creates backwards EMF. Field weakening relies on a control method known as Field Orientated Control, or FOC for short. If you want to understand how FOC works in greater detail, I would recommend researching it online. There's a lot of jargon that I could use here, but I'm going to oversimplify it as best I can. 
Once again, a lot of detailed information online can be found on this subject. But in layman's terms, the faster your motor spins, the larger the opposing magnetic force in the other direction becomes. Field weakening acts to reduce this opposition. For every percent of field weakening that you add, you're taking away that percent of DC amps that would contribute to your torque, and instead you're using it to reduce the magnetic field. While this increases your speed, it decreases your torque and generates more heat. All right, thanks for watching this video, guys. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please smash that like button and consider subscribing to the channel if you would like more content like this. Thank you and have a nice day.